The topic today is why so many lawyers. Did you know that in this great land of the free and the brave and the indebted, there are almost one million lawyers? Did you know that? It's 260 million of us here in this country and one million lawyers. One lawyer for every 260 people. I'm going to answer the question today, going to try to, can we learn some lessons of spiritual importance from the goings on in Washington? You've got to be blind if you can't see what's going on in Washington every time you turn on TV, if you open up Time magazine or Newsweek or something like this. My father, who was, um, had an Irish background, used to talk about the shenanigans. Shenanigans. You can imagine what shenanigans are. The word sort of describes it. We're going to mention some of the shenanigans that are going on in Washington. What is truth? What is truth? How important is it to tell the truth? Should a person always tell the truth? And does it matter what a person believes? It's commonly believed today by millions and millions of people that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you simply believe something. Does it matter what one believes? And how can a person tell what is right and wrong? In universities today, they're starting to run classes and courses in ethics to tell business people what's right and what's wrong. Let me tell you before we go any further a story about a lawyer. And I should say this because I guess Harold Follett's going to watch this sometime. <laughs> Harold Follett is an attorney and a, one of my closest and dearest friends. And he will be, I believe, after this program. There was a new lawyer who had just opened his office, just put out his shingle. And somebody came walking along the path and stepped into the room and he said, Ah, a client already, he thought, as he saw the door opening. He thought to himself, I must impress him. So he picked up the phone and said, no, I'm very, very sorry, but I can't take your case. No, not even for a thousand dollars. I'm just too busy. And replaced the receiver and looked at the caller whom he was trying to impress. And now, my good man, what can I do for you? He asked briskly. Nothing really, said the man. I just came to connect your telephone. Think about it, folks. <laughs> there is a text in the Bible that says, be sure your sins will find you out. And whether you're a lawyer or a preacher, doesn't matter who you are, be sure your sin will find you out. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Now, folks, I, I appreciate when you laugh at my jokes because I've got four jokes now. That's the fourth one I've ever told. So when I tell a joke, it's really something. Now we come to the question, why so many lawyers? I want to answer that question with another question. Could it be that we are fast becoming a nation of lawless people? And that's why we need experts in the law to get us off the hook. Could it be that the unrighteous use lawyers to unlawfully, though legally take advantage of others. Is that the reason we have so many lawsuits? Did you know there are more lawyers in Washington, D.C. than in the whole nation of Japan? Did you know that we as a people sue more than any other nation, any other group of people on the face of the earth? Is it symptomatic of a deep spiritual sickness? Have we become a lawless people? Could it be that we need many lawyers to protect us from the results of our sins? Could it even be that the righteous people, righteous, decent people, need honest lawyers to help them in conflict with evil powers? Now, I've had uh, uh, some wonderful association with Christian lawyers. I thank God for Christian lawyers who've come and stood at my side and given me counsel. But could it be that today even people who are trying to do what is right need lawyers to help them in the conflict with evil powers? But could it be 
that the huge army of lawyers in North America is a sign of our moral disintegration. Is it not true that honest people and honest nation need very few lawyers? And why is it that in this country we've got more lawyers than just about the rest of the world together? Where there is a great plague, you need a lot of doctors. I would suggest today there's a great plague in America. It's a plague of sin. And that's why we've got ourselves so many lawyers. I'm going to read you a passage out of the Bible, which is a very strong passage. I almost hesitate to read it. It's a description of ancient Israel, but I believe it's a description of America, North America. It's a description of us today. Please take your Bible, would you mind, and turn to Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 to 16. I want you please to take your Bible and make sure that you can see a text. See the text. Make sure you can see a Bible. This is a strong, strong passage. Isaiah chapter 59. It was written during a time of national and spiritual crisis in the land of Israel. I believe that the Bible is relevant to our needs today. And I'm going to read this passage concerning things that happened in the past because they describe us today. These texts describe us today. Isaiah 59. Have you got the Bible, dear friends? Got the text? Surely, this is verse 1, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Now the Bible says, if you think God isn't listening to you, then it's not because of God. It's not because God's got deaf. It's not because his arm is too short. God can help you. So if you're not getting your prayers answered, or if something's gone wrong, don't blame it on God. Verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. There's something that I've noticed over and over again in the Bible. That while God is merciful and gracious, and while we are all sinners, and I am the chief of sinners, Paul said he was the chief of sinners, I recognize that I am a sinner, saved by grace. But I want to tell you something, the Bible seems to be very, very strongly opposed to the sin of lying. I think lying perhaps is the worst of sins because after a while, if a person tells enough lies, he can't tell the difference between truth and error. And when a person comes to the place where he's a, an habitual liar, and he's lying all the time, he's virtually past the point of redemption. Because if a person lies enough, he'll start to lie about himself. And when a person lies enough about himself, he doesn't feel his need of the blood of Jesus. And so the Bible is so strong against the sin of lying. Verse 4, no one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and speak lies. Notice lies, lies. It comes through over and over again. This is the sin of these people. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and acts of violence are in their hands. You notice what it says? They make a garment, but the garment won't cover them. And so a person, if a person's going to be a liar, he needs to have a pretty good memory. But the problem is with most people who tell lies, they don't have perfect memories. And so they spin a garment, but the garment can't stretch over their naked bodies. And so the Bible here is talking about the awful sin of injustice and the sin of lying. Now verse, let me see, verse 7, their feet rush into sin, they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They've turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we are like the dead. 
We all growl like bears. We moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none. For deliverance, but it is far away. So this is now a description of people who are becoming depressed. They've told so many lies, and they've made so many mistakes, that now they look for light and they can't see any light. They're absolutely and completely depressed, and they feel a sense of hopelessness coming over them. Verse 12 says, For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquity. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth is stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. What a picture this is. This is a picture of almost total depravity. When the Lord comes to his people, the children of Israel, he looks them over, and he says, I can't find a single man. I can't find a man I can depend on. And so here is the great portrayal of the sin of ancient Israel. I would suggest that if God were writing a chapter today about us, about America and Canada, this part of the world in which we live, I think God, after looking at the newspapers from what's going on, the shenanigans up there in Washington, D.C., would say something similar. Back there, he saw no man. While this is a description of Israel two and a half thousand years ago, does it not describe us as a nation? We are confronted daily, almost to our embarrassment, by a spectacle of cheating, philandering, betrayal, lying, slandering, and swindling in Washington, D.C., and I would say not only in Washington, D.C. Lawyers in Washington, D.C., in this part of the world, are becoming fat on the rotting carcass. Lawyers are becoming fat, wealthy, on the rotting carcass. Like birds of prey, they feast upon the dead. When I was in Africa running campaigns, I went out on safari, and I would see the vultures that would come and feed on the prey. And today, many lawyers have become like birds of prey, eating on dead flesh and getting fat. One commentator recently, and he was a lawyer, said, talking about what goes on in court, he says, everyone lies in court anyhow. Everyone lies. I dispute it. I don't believe everyone lies, but I believe that many do. And he indicated it's okay to lie. In fact, some government agencies, I was astounded to find this out, that some of the government agencies are facing people who have got money and they're saying, if you're caught doing something wrong on the job, it's okay to lie because lying is now acceptable. If Isaiah were with us today, I think he would write again Isaiah chapter 59. I believe that what is happening in Washington today, this cancer on the nation, is a sign of the times. I wish to remind you today that God right now is looking for his man and looking for his woman. I believe that God is searching the church and searching the world and looking for his man and for his woman. Would you come over here to a similar passage to the book of Ezekiel 22 and verse 26 and onwards. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 26 and onwards, dear hearts and gentle people, it concerns a similar time in the history of the children of Israel. I want you to notice the text today in the word of God. And remember Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Notice these words. Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. They say, this is what the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. 
The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy and mistreat the alien, denying them justice. I looked for a man among them. Look at it. Look at the text. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. What a text. This is a picture of God. And he comes down from heaven and he walks the streets of Jerusalem. He walks the streets of Washington, D.C. And he walks the streets of Los Angeles. And as he walks the streets, he's looking for a man. A man who will stand in the breach. And a man who will stand for truth and for righteousness. I say today, God is looking for his man and his woman. Has he found that person in you today? He is looking for men and women who will tell the truth. He is looking for an honest man, an honest woman. I ask you as I look into your faces, are you honest? Do you tell the truth? Do I tell the truth? I have known many, many honest people and quite a few dishonest ones. But some of the most honest people I've known in my life I have found here in Los Angeles. Some of the most honest people I've met are people who live here in Southern California. I'm not going to mention them so I won't embarrass them, but one lady who was one of the most honest people I know is here today. She served on the conference committee for years. An honest child of God. I love her. I respect her. I think of my friend back in Melbourne, Keith Johansson. If Keith promised me something, if he said, John, I will get you the money for those projectors, how much will it be? 20,000. He'd do some calculations. Then he'd say, you can have it on such and such a date. I didn't need to think twice about it. I didn't even get him write it down. You know why? Because he was honest. Did I need a lawyer? No, I didn't need a lawyer. You only need lawyers basically when you're dealing with people that you can't trust. But he's a man, Keith is a man of absolute honesty. I think of another friend of mine, Larry Jones, who worked with me in a campaign in the city of Melbourne. He called me up some months ago. He said, John, You know the Greek church that we started there in Melbourne after the campaign? Yes, the first Greek church outside of Athens on that occasion, outside of Greece. I said, yes, of course. He said, the folks still remember you. I said, that's sweet of them. He said, they want to do something for the people in Russia. I said, I'm I'm touched. He said, we are getting together. How much do you need to build a church? So I told him, he said, do you know of any cities that need a church? Do I ever? He said, can you think of one? I said, yes, the city of Dzinsk where we ran a video campaign. No church, people meeting in a dirty little hall in freezing conditions, and Vadim ran a campaign there too. He said, how much? I said, 60,000. He said, all right, 60,000 it is. Then they had the Asian crisis didn't influence America a lot, influenced Australia, and the dollar went into a decline. Keith had to find at least another 30%. Laurie had to find another 30%. When he called me, I said, Laurie, what about the Asian crisis? He said, what did I tell you? I said, 60,000. He said, well, 60,000 it is. He said, what's wrong? You say that's unusual? No. That's how it ought to be. It may be unusual, but it's how it ought to be. It is how it is with honorable people. There's one man in our church who is our treasurer, Roland Stewart. I don't wish to embarrass him, but I admire him and respect him. He's an honest, honest man. I feel warm towards him. He is what I have always visualized a true American to be. He fought for his country. He came out to Australia, spent time in Australia. 
And so I have an, a feeling towards him. But when he goes through the receipts, sometimes this happens. A person will write down, I put in $300. And then for whatever reason, they don't put anything in. Maybe it's lost or they forget to put it in. But Roland goes through and he counts up the receipts, counts it up. Say if it comes just, just for fun, we'll say $5,000. But it only, there's only money for 4700 Roland has done something I've told him he shouldn't do. He takes the money out of his own pocket and puts it in. He says, I don't want anybody ever saying that we're not absolutely honest. I have seen in this country some awful dishonesty. I've also seen some magnificent honesty. Roland Stewart, our treasurer, is absolutely honest. I would trust him with anything. Then over in Texas, there's Mrs. Perti, a little Texan lady. Bless her. On occasion, she makes a pledge to the ministry. Is she wealthy? No, she's poor. Poor as a church mouse. She's 80 years of age. If she makes a pledge, she will do it or die. She takes in washing and clothing and works all the night and sends us $100, $200. You say that's not much. It is if you're only getting, say, $4 an hour. But she's absolutely honest. I salute these people. They are people of great merit. A person whom we all appreciate, I think, in this country is General Colin Powell. General Powell said recently, America desperately needs more than anything else a rebirth of shame. 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 What was he talking about? He was talking about the fact that for millions of people, there is no shame in lying. No guilty conscience. No shame in slandering. No shame in gossiping. No shame in stealing. No shame in betraying sacred trust. The awful thing is, my friend, when a person has no shame, a person can do these things, but he doesn't have a conscience. So General Colin Powell said, we need a sense of shame. Somebody else has said, it's great to have the Statue of Liberty over there in New York Harbor, but Los Angeles needs the Statue of Responsibility. Not enough, my friend, to have liberty without responsibility because that is license. And so we need not only the statue of liberty but the statue of responsibility. Don't you get tired of hearing people say, and they've said it to me when they've been caught in evil, they say, it's a free country. I can do what I like. No shame. Let me talk for a moment about slander because a lot of what is going on in Washington, I'm sure, is just plain slander. Most of us have made up our minds when most of us haven't heard the other side. Most of us do not know what's going on. We listen to what is fed to us from television and like dummies, we believe what we see and we hear. But a man who is a slanderer and a gossip came to the rabbi of his town and he said, Rabbi, I have been slandering your name all over town. I've come to ask your forgiveness so that God will forgive me. The rabbi said, it is simple, my friend. Have you got a pillow that has feathers in it? Yes. I want you to go and stand on the top of the hill tonight and shake the pillow into the wind until every feather is gone and then come back and see me in the morning. 
And so he did. And the next morning he came back and he said, Rabbi, I have done what you told me to do. I have shaken the pillow in the wind and all the feathers are scattered everywhere. He said, I'm glad. Now go and get every feather, every feather and put it back in the pillowcase. And when every feather is back, God will forgive you. If somebody says, but that's too hard. No, that's justice. That's right. That's honor. If you have slandered a person, I look you in the eye. If you have gossiped, if you have told lies, you cannot be saved or forgiven until you've done everything you can that is humanly possible to put the feathers back into the pillowcase. That is the word of God. That is the teaching of the Bible. So the general says we need a rebirth of shame. God is looking for men and women who will make wrong things right, who have a sense of shame that they have sinned. God is walking the streets of Los Angeles, the streets of the villages and the towns of North America. He's walking the aisles, walking around the pews here, looking for men and women who understand what constitutes right and wrong. How can we tell what is right and what is wrong? I've gone through a personal crisis that you folk know about and it has influenced members of our church. I have been amazed, dazed, and stunned that many people to whom I preached the word for years have never come to understand what's right and what's wrong. I am amazed. Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. How can I tell what is right, what is wrong? The word of God. I've had people, even members that I love and appreciate, come to me and say, Pastor Carter, everyone has a different view of truth. Some have even said to me, what you think is truth, for you is truth. If that is so, no one will ever, ever be saved because we cannot tell what is white and what is black and what is up and what is down. Truth is truth is truth is truth. Lying is lying is lying is lying. Righteousness is righteousness is righteousness. Others have said to me, you define for yourself truth. In some universities in the United States of America, this comes, will come as a surprise to some of you. In certain courses, they are rewriting history. They're rewriting the stories of the pharaohs. They're rewriting the stories of the pyramids. It's phony baloney, but people are getting PhDs by doing this stuff. And the teachers say, who have a political agenda, they say, it doesn't matter whether it happened or not, as long as you think it did. And as long as it makes you feel good. My friend, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, People will receive the mark of the beast and they will be damned because they believed the lie. Therefore, I say, how can we tell what is the truth? By going to the word of God. That is why I urge upon every person sitting here in this church today, I do it wherever I go. I say to people, don't follow me, follow the word. Read the Bible every day. Have you got a Bible? I say, then read the Bible every day because the word of God is truth. God, my friend, today 
is walking the streets of Los Angeles. He's walking the aisles of this church. He's walking the streets of New York and Boston. He's looking for his man and his woman who have determined to keep themselves uncorrupted. People say everybody is lying. Everybody is stealing. Everybody is carrying out dirty lawsuits. We must be part of it. My friend, I want to be part of the church of the living God that keeps itself unspotted from the world. I want you please to take your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, dear hearts. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, dear hearts, the Bible says, so that you may become blameless and what? Pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Never think for a moment that has never been this bad before. Never think the shenanigans of Washington, D.C. are new. In some ways, it was far worse in the days of the Roman Empire. It was worse for pornography. Brothels were everywhere. And the Bible says, be different so that you will shine like lights in the darkness, stars in the darkness. Some years ago, I went to Mount Sinai. And while I was at Mount Sinai, I stayed in a little cabin. At one night, it was bitterly cold, I went outside. You seem to be a million miles from nowhere. The night was so black and the stars were so bright. The blacker the night, the brighter they shine. The blacker the night, the brighter they shine. God is calling you to shine, shine, shine for Jesus. When we lived in North Queensland in the tropics in Australia 20 years ago or something, there was a pond that was called the Goose Pond. A lot of slime was there, but out of that slime came the most beautiful lilies. I don't care where you live. Whether you live in South Central, I don't care where you live. I don't care whether you live in East St. Louis, I don't care where you live. Lilies can grow in the slime. God is looking for men and women who will be different because it is right to be different. Who won't be brainwashed. I'm concerned sometimes when groups of people say we act as groups of people. In this church, we don't act as a group. We act as individuals. Even if this whole church should do something that was wrong, and I should do something that is wrong, and lead that you should say, I will do what is right, because it's right. I will stand alone. I told you many years ago the story of the Valley of the Blind. It's a fable, but over there in the Himalayas, there was a little valley. And a man from the west stumbled into this valley. I don't know how he got there, plane crashed or something, I don't know. But when he got there, he found that everybody in the valley was blind. And they thought he was odd because he could see. And so they talked him into having an operation so he could become normal. They were going to take his eyes out. He wanted to marry the chief's daughter. They said, you can marry her, but you've got to become blind like us. So he was going to have the operation, let them cut out his eyes. Because they said, he's odd. He sees. <laughs> At the very last, he ran away. He was saved. He lost the girl, but he kept his eyes. Lose the girl, but keep your eyes. I want to tell you folks something. Even though every person is blind and is stumbling, you need to see. Do what is right because it is right. God 
today is looking for his men and women whose belief in the great truths of the word will determine their conduct. Let me say that again. God is looking for men and women whose beliefs will determine their conduct. I want you to take that map that I passed out today as you came in. And I want you to notice something that will amaze you. This is the results of a Gallup poll. This is published by uh, USA News and World Report. I'm just going to hold it here and the camera maybe can get on it. This is called The Clean and the Sleazy. And it rates different nations according to the, their cleanliness or their sleaziness. The darker the color, the deep red, the sleazier. And the greener, the better. I don't show this to you so you'll say, hey, where? I don't like looking at where I came from. I want to remind you folks of something. Listen to this. Are you listening? Jesus was brought up in the sleaziest country, the sleaziest town in that country. It was Nazareth. When they heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, you know what they said? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I show this to you because it illustrates a great truth. You know what it illustrates? Notice the countries that are in red there. Notice them. They're either communist, atheistic countries or countries that have been ruled by false religious systems. There are some countries there that are in gray. You know why they're there? They're off the wall. They can't get a reading. Notice the countries that are in green. They have one thing in common. Do you know what it is? They were a part of the great reformation of Bible reading that swept the world. Did you know that? But the countries that are in gray or red are either communist, atheistic, or countries that have been ruled by false religious systems. People say, it doesn't matter what I believe, are you kidding someone? If you come from a country in red, you can be a star shining in the darkness. But I'm here to tell you this. Listen to me. Listen carefully to me. Those countries in the world that were based upon faith in God, even though they lost a lot of that faith in recent times, those countries that believed in the teachings of the Bible and that taught the great principles of freedom and liberty and the law of God became the countries, became the countries, where is it again? They became the countries in green. But the countries that embraced socialism and atheism became the sleaziest countries in the world. Now, I'm going to tell you folks something. Would you rather be clean or a sleaze? <laughs> if you want to be clean, your beliefs shape your destiny. Your beliefs shape your destiny. The cleanest people, the most prosperous people, the happiest people, the most honest people are people, my friend, who have an ethic that is based upon the Word of God. Whether they are white or black or brown or yellow or whether they're green with envy. It doesn't matter what they, their background is. If they have that common belief in God and the Word, then, my friend, they will not be the sleaze. They will be the clean. And so I want to tell you, folks, something. What we need is a return to the Bible and a return to the God who made us. That is what 
we need. Your belief system does make a difference. And I want to tell somebody, everybody here, somebody, everybody, I want to tell you this. The Bible teaches that judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. You can read about that in Isaiah, Ezekiel, all these other verses. If you go to the city of Washington on one of the great monuments, you find the words talking about the iniquitous practice of slavery. And it was Lincoln. I'm not sure it was Lincoln, but one of those great founders of this nation, one of the great presidents said, God is just and justice cannot sleep forever. You see, there's a, there's a judgment day. This nation cannot continue as it is. The world cannot continue as it is. You know the story of Belshazzar's drunken feast and the hand that came out, the bloodless hand, and wrote over against the, on the plaster against the pillar. Meany, meany, tackle you fasten. Your weight in the balances and found wanting. Liars will not always get away with it. Cheats will not always get away with it. There is coming a judgment day. Therefore, it is my settled belief today, it is time for us to turn to the Lord for mercy. It is no time for a parade of self-righteousness because we're all sinners. But there is an urgent message for us who profess to be believers in God to turn to God. Would you please come over here to Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. And remember the old saying is true, what you do sounds so loudly in my ears, I can't hear what you're saying. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. And after Zechariah has described the lying and the cheating and the sins of his own people, then he gives us some hope. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. He says, on that day... A fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. And so the good news is there's mercy and there's forgiveness for all who will come in repentance. And as God looks today around this church, May he find his man and his woman. He's been looking a long, long time. It might have been today he'll find a people whose lives have been washed in the blood of Christ and a people whose spirits have been renewed by the Holy Spirit and a people who are like lilies growing in the slime like stars on a black, black night. I want you to kneel now. We're going to pray. Our Father, today, this is a strong word. But Lord, we're living in a very serious time. And judgment is standing at the gate. And there needs to be a turning to God a turning from lying and cheating and stealing and gossiping and slandering and lawsuiting and greed and all of those evil things. We thank you for the good lawyers you put in our midst. Dear Father, we thank you today that even though we're great sinners, that Jesus is a great Savior and that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Help us to realize that, however, it's not just when we come to God, it's not just a case of saying, well, Lord, forgive me, and then going out and forgetting about the feathers. Help us to recognize that we have a responsibility to do all we can to put the feathers back in the bag. And that is the fruit of repentance. It shows whether we're genuine or whether we're just talking. We don't want to be just talking today. We want you to come into our hearts and wash us clean. And then, dear Father, put your spirit in us in a great way so that we will be your people. So that when you're looking for men and women, and back there you couldn't find one, you'll say, hey, I have found a multitude who have given their hearts to me 
and who are walking with me. We thank you for the beautiful text that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that whoever believes will not perish, but of everlasting life. We thank you that there's hope for the most hopeless, there's mercy for the most sinful, and there's grace that is greater than all of our sin. And we thank you for that. And today we want to come to you. We want to come back to you because some of us have been wandering away from you. Some of us have been like Peter walking a long way off. How many today can raise a hand and say, Lord, I want to come back to you? Lift up your hand. Say it to the Lord. Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to walk closer with you. I want to be your child. I don't want to be a put on, but I want to walk with you. I want you to wash me clean today. I'm weak and poor and needy, but I thank you that you love me today. Lift up your hands and say, God, just wash me today. I confess my sins to you today. By your grace, come and live in me, Lord, and help me to be your man, your woman, for such a time as this.